Good morning, Bible family. Thanks so much for being with us this morning and for allowing us to be a part of your Palm Sunday celebration. In a few short moments, Pastor Steve is gonna open the book of John with us and share with us and challenge us to make a few choices as we enter into our week. He's also gonna bring in a kernel of corn and we're gonna see how that applies to our lives. But before we get to that, I wanted to lay out a few details as we move forward in this month. I don't know if you've heard yet or not, but President Trump has asked us to continue our stay at home order that has been in place for the last two weeks. He's asked it to continue to the end of April. So the church leadership has decided that we're going to actually postpone all of the church activities, all the public activities during the month of April. I know this brings some disappointment since we won't be back together again for Easter, but remember, Easter isn't canceled. Just our opportunity to celebrate together has been postponed. So as a result, our new aim is to be back together again for April, May, or excuse me, for Sunday, May 3rd. Even though all of our previously scheduled church events for April have been canceled, we can still redeem this month each day by intentionally praying for one another. Earlier this week, we sent out a prayer calendar so that you can pray through each family of our church by name. And even though you may not know what to pray or you may not even know the individual, you can still pray for them and God's word actually lays it out for us. Uh, we've, so we put some scripture on the bottom of that page to help us pray for each other. On the back of that calendar, the birthdays and anniversaries are still listed out so you can still drop people birthday greetings and anniversary greetings throughout the month. And there's even a chance to download the, uh, the, the uh, calendar on your computer and print it, or you can just view it on your mobile device, whatever's easiest. Also, maybe you have a, a few extra moments during the month, during each day, to, uh, to take a look at our online church directory. And we're, we're noticing that we're missing a few, a few of those pictures. And so in that same email that we sent out, we also sent out directions on how to update your church picture in our online church directory. Now, let's continue our morning service as Pastor Steve shares with us from the book of John. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. It's Palm Sunday. This is a Sunday that's a Sunday that's full of excitement, really. There's pageantry, there's palm branches, all kinds of stuff. And so I want us to look at that story a little bit, but not the part that maybe you're thinking about. Um, as I was studying, I wanted to give us the rest of the story on Palm Sunday. So first, I want us to watch a, a video that kind of explores the part that you, you know most from the perspective of a character. So let's watch that right now. Okay, let me get this out of the way. I didn't steal that donkey, okay? I, I borrowed it. And, and it wasn't even my idea. Jesus told me to take it, to, to, to borrow it, right? Um, okay, this is, this is how it happened. Um, earlier today, there was a large group of us and we were traveling from Bethany to Jerusalem. We stopped just outside the city and Jesus looked at two of us and he said there was an unridden donkey just inside the village and asked us to go get it. He said, if anybody, you know, ask us about it, we could just look at him and say, the Lord needs it and he'll send it back. So the two of us beat it into town. And the whole time we were like, what is Jesus going to do with a donkey, right? But by this point, we realized you don't second guess Jesus, right? He hadn't told us why and we didn't ask. We just got him a donkey. And when we got back, <laughs> that's... Uh, that's what it uh, that's what it happened um, some people put their coats on the donkey and Jesus got on the donkey and um, <laughs> when he got on the donkey <sighs> I don't know it's like um, everyone started shouting and dancing and singing and um, some people were throwing their coats in front of the donkey there, there was there was a, some of us that grabbed some palm branches and we started waving them in the air and that's when it clicked 
Jesus had finally arrived. Um, I know that sounds weird. That's it. No, it's, it's like this. Um, in the past, we would get excited because Jesus would do something, a miracle, or he, there would be some parable, or something he said. We'd get excited about it, and Jesus would always be like, shh, come on, guys. No, 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 nope. Just be quiet, you know? And then we'd come up with some idea. Hey, let's do this, or let's do that, and Jesus would, would be like, no, guys, no, not, not now, not now. But today, <laughs> today was now. Today, he finally let us shout and sing and dance and treat him like the Messiah that we'd all been waiting for. He finally showed up. <laughs> ah, I don't know. Um, I don't know what tomorrow holds. Um, it feels like it's something big, but who knows, you know? But it doesn't matter what happens because Jesus showed up. And there, <laughs> there's nothing better than when Jesus shows up. <laughs>
that witness that was being assigned kind of sent the Pharisees over the edge. They started tearing into each other and basically saying, you're worthless, you can't get the job done. And these Pharisees had been pretty serious. Back in chapter 11 of John, um, they said, this guy's going to make us lose our place, the temple, or our nation. You know, Rome was in charge over them, but they at least existed, and they had kind of a semi-comfortable arrangement with a power structure and a way they could enjoy life. And they were afraid that Jesus was going to upset the apple cart. They even went so far as to plot to kill Lazarus. So after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11, they set a plot. We got to kill this guy because at least we got to make him dead again so people won't be talking about him. It kind of brings us to one of the most important things about this story. When we talk about Jesus and his work and his power, it is astounding, miraculous power. And Jesus' power over death and our belief in that comes from eyewitnesses. These were people who saw it, who walked with Jesus and proclaimed it to everybody. This isn't like second, third, fourth hand. It was written down, and John actually got to hear these witnesses of people saying, I saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. Um, not what they heard others say, but what they actually saw. And that helps us because we get to remember that belief in Jesus is not intellectual inferiority. We don't have a poor case. Actually, it accounts for the facts. The eyewitnesses account for the facts of what happened and give us confidence in what we believe. It also reminds us that people who try to deny the miracles of Jesus while claiming to be religious are on the wrong side. That's clear who the villains are in this and how mad they were at Jesus. And the Pharisees actually, I think, represent people today, too. Pharisees kind of equal people today who want to have just a rational religion. You know, uh, it's uh, something that can be held in the common marketplace and everybody can agree to, but we don't need any of this supernatural stuff. Or they want a, a moral religion so that there's moral guidelines, but don't get too crazy with people coming back from the dead, fish and loaves being multiplied, whatever it is, walking on the water. Don't give me any of that kind of stuff. So if if we have a tendency, or if people in our culture today try to minimize what Jesus did, his miraculous power, they're just like the Pharisees. They're trying to squelch the power of God and what believing in Jesus is really about. And the fact that God has his power available today for transforming lives, if we try to minimize that, we're doing a disservice to all of what Jesus did. All right, so let's, let's continue on in this story understanding the, the, the two sides and how the response shows us a little bit, but there's a little bit more that happens. Let me go on to verse 20. There were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. So people who weren't Israelis, Israelites. These therefore came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Um, Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip came and they told Jesus. So um, this, these, these Greek people, you can imagine why they'd want to meet Jesus. I mean, seeing this crowd, hearing what the crowd was saying about him, we got to meet this guy. And so they made this request and wanted to, wanted to meet him. So they asked Philip, one of the disciples. We don't know why they chose him. Um, but it's kind of funny. Philip didn't ask Jesus himself. He went and told Andrew, should I, should I bring this up to Jesus or not? And I guess they, they must have decided, okay, we'll, we'll go down together on this one if Jesus doesn't like the request. So they both went and asked him. And we don't see whether Jesus actually met these people. The, the text doesn't tell us that. Um, but it seems that their request was an occasion for Jesus to do some teaching on some stuff that really matters to us, some significant statements that he made. So let me read a little bit further, starting in verse 23. And it says, and Jesus answered them, so he said something, but it wasn't an answer to the request. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world shall find it. 
And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So, I just read verse 23 through 26. And verse 23 starts with the glory of Jesus and it ends with Jesus' servants being honored. So honor and glory are part of this. So how does Jesus get glorified and how do his servants get honor? How does that happen? And really, the how of that glory and honor is very different than probably what those Greeks were thinking it was going to be and probably what you or I might expect Jesus to say about glory and honor coming. And really, the stakes of Glory to Jesus and honor for us come from how we view the life we're living on this planet right now. How we view it, what we look at it. And, and Jesus used a picture to teach that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use corn instead of wheat, okay? So this is some kernels of corn that would be seed for planting out in the ground. And Jesus said, um, truly, unless a grain of wheat, corn, falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. I've I've planted corn before, and you get your packet of seeds, and they, they're all dried out and withered um, hard. And you can keep them for a couple of years, and you could still germinate them. I've even heard of seeds that have lasted multiple years, but they just kind of rattle around dry and hard in that container by themselves. And it says, unless a kernel of wheat um, falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone. Because here's kind of what it looks like when that kernel dies. Um, it starts withering away, getting used up by the new plants. So this is a germinated piece of corn, and you can see how that corn kernel is going away. And then finally, after it's all the way used up and it grows, you have this beautiful stalk of corn, and it hopefully has ears on it with thousands of kernels. A huge production of a, this big, huge plant from this tiny little seed. And what Jesus is saying is, really, do you want to be the kernel or the plant? Which do you want to be? And he says, completely investing or being buried in, having your life buried in service to Christ is ultimately caring nothing for your life in this world. If you say, okay, my life is going to be about serving Jesus and that's it, and I don't care what happens to me here as long as I can serve Jesus. That's what he's saying. That's the, the kernel being planted in the ground. That's how Jesus lived, right? And, and that's what he wants from his followers. If you choose to invest in what is temporary, you're going to be the seed that rattles around in the container, dried out little tiny husk that never produces anything. And even that won't last either. Eventually those seeds will dry out and go away. The choice before us and what Jesus is saying in response to these Greeks, he's like, if you want your life to count, you have to let it be buried in service to Jesus. Otherwise, you can choose to live this life and have your little self in the little container, but you won't produce anything. The opportunity is God giving you honor that will last forever. That's what this is. And so the question Jesus says is, is asking us to consider is, how are you choosing? So if that's the case, we have to ask, what can you, what can we point to in our lives? That it is investment that you know that is going to last forever. It is buried in servant, service to Christ. And so we know because it's in service to Christ, it is going to produce something that we can't even imagine because God makes all of that happen out of the seed. My choice is what am I going to be, do with the seed, invest my life, life or not? What, what are the markers in, in your mind and heart that make you know that what you're doing is ministry for Jesus? Jesus on this Palm Sunday declaration, use the time to teach and say, choose what your life is going to be about. So consider that. What do you want to be, the seed or do you want to be the plant? And where will you invest for that? We kind of look at Jesus' purpose, and it's kind of amazing what happens next. His purpose is validated and it's explained. Let me read starting in verse 27. Jesus says, now my soul has become troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. There came, therefore, a voice out of heaven. 
I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The multitude, therefore, who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world shall be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate what kind of death by which he was to die. The multitude therefore answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus therefore said to them, For a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, that darkness may not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light in order that you may become sons of the light. All right, let's look at this, this little section together. Jesus starts off this section by saying, my soul has become troubled. That, that's stirred up or distressed or agitated. So we can see right off the bat that follow, choosing to follow Jesus, to go after glorifying him, isn't going to be easy necessarily. It wasn't for Jesus to glorify God. It wasn't easy for him. He was distressed about it. Um, and this section in John is actually before Jesus got to the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember, he went there with his disciples to pray, and he sweat drops of blood there, and that's where he prayed, Father, not my will, but yours be done. So this wasn't a one-time thing there. He was for many days wrestling with what it was going to take for him to glorify God. It was a hard thing that he had to walk through. It distressed him. And so Jesus let us in, let the people in right there. How do I make this choice? What will I say? And Jesus said, and what shall I say? Father, rescue me out of this hour? He's like, should I say that? But then he said, you know, for this purpose, I came to this hour. This is the whole reason I've done all of what I've done so far. It is for this moment. So there's the other choice. Should I say, Father, keep me in this hour? Right? Either, Father, take me out of this hour or keep me in this hour. So then when Jesus says, Father, glorify your name, he was saying, keep me in this hour. That was Jesus' choice. So we have to make those choices too. But choosing to submit, God, submit to God's will is the safest place to be. And it's a place of mercy too. It's not fearful because God is merciful. So think about that. If I say, Okay, God, I'm willing to walk through this, whatever this hard thing is. You're submitting to God because you want glory for him, and that's most important. But you're not doing it to a God who's unkind. He is full of mercy, compassion, grace that he pours out. So it's a safe place to be, and there's mercy and grace because that's who he is, and God gets glory when we choose to live that way. So, so what do you face that you would far prefer to have removed when it seems that obeying God's word sends you through a difficulty. There's probably some of that that you have to face in life. Or maybe, it's, maybe it's losing your job because you can't, in good conscience before God, do what your boss asks you to do. You can't do that. And man, if I choose to follow God's principles, I might lose my job. It's a hard one. But glory to God matters most, right? What about risking the loss of a relationship or or comfort in life because you know you need to have a conversation about how God's word fits with what person's doing or not doing in life, and it, they don't match. And that's going to be a hard conversation. And what if the relationships were list, risked? What if it's lost? I don't want to have that conversation, but, but I want to please God. Maybe it's choosing to give up a role in church that you absolutely love. You just want to do this and have been doing it, because someone else could fill your spot and you know that you could fill another one that's empty, but you don't really enjoy it, but you want to glorify God. Maybe during this coronavirus, you have a neighbor who has a need and you are thinking, I could meet that need, but it, it means I might lose something that I like. 
Maybe it's even something big. But I want to glorify God. Choosing to submit to God's will is still the safest place to be, even though it's hard. Ultimately, Jesus did that. Jesus chose to embrace something that he didn't personally desire. Because doing so would show God's magnificence, glory, to everyone watching. And the question for us is, will you? Now, God spoke verbally out of heaven. I I had missed this before. I don't know if I ever remember this as part of a Palm Sunday story, but this happened right on the the trailing end of this. And previously, God had already spoken out of heaven verbally. First time was kind of at the beginning of Jesus' ministry at his baptism. So this is my beloved son, whom I'm well pleased. Then it happened kind of at the midpoint too. It was at his transfiguration. And what happened there? Jesus and a few disciples went up on a mountain and Jesus all of a sudden started glowing white and all kinds of amazing stuff. The voice of God, Moses and Elijah came there. That was kind of at the midpoint of his ministry and the Father spoke out of heaven there too. And then kind of this time is the third time. It's at the end of his ministry. It, you know, he has, basically at this point, he's got about 40 days left of his time on the earth, his, his ministry. And God the Father spoke out of heaven and said, and remember, Jesus had just said, Um, I need to, Father, glorify your name. And in response to Jesus saying that, God says, I have done that. And that would be Jesus' whole ministry to this point. Jesus responding in the pressure of this moment to say, even though it's hard, God, I will follow you. But then he says, and I will do it again. The Father said that out of heaven. I believe that that is looking forward to the cross and the resurrection and all kinds of other things that came after that. And in that whole sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, God was going to rightfully take care of and and pay the penalty for the problem of sin and offer forgiveness and life. He was going to glorify his name in that way. Now, a voice out of heaven, that is crazy. I know there's all kinds of stuff happening in Jerusalem, but this is a big deal. And obviously Jesus heard it and understood the words because he said, this voice came for, for you, John. The writer of this gospel clearly heard what was said, knew where it was from, but the crowd didn't have a a complete grid for it. They said it must have been thunder or an angel talked to him. They they knew it was something more than a normal person, but they didn't have a complete grid for it. And Jesus said that the voice was for them. It was for the people listening. It wasn't for him. Um, It was for the people to know that God was ready to depose Satan from his place of power in the world. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, God spoke out loud, saying about the glorifying of himself through me because Satan is done. Jesus' death, him being lifted up, would do that, and it would provide hope and help for the entire world. So God's verbal announcement out of heaven at Palm Sunday was the marker, the the marking place for the balance of power being put back to where it belongs. That also means that from that day on, from the day that Jesus rose from the dead after his death and and that resurrection, anything else that Satan does, all of his work is just spin control. He's just trying to spin spin the news. (laughs) I'm trying to keep people believing lies that he actually has something to offer when he's really done. Um, Or providing distractions so that he can pull as many people as possible away from believing in God. But God said, just so you know, Satan doesn't have power anymore. I've already won. The rest of this time is just him grasping at straws. But the crowd, they're still trying to figure this out, and they they said, how could the Messiah die? Um, How could death be a part of what the chosen one would experience? He hadn't given them their nation back yet, and they knew the Messiah was supposed to do that. Jesus' work was a spiritual work this first time. The whole nation part is coming later. And it's why our work now in the church time is a spiritual work, not as much about the physical work, although the physical helps us accomplish the spiritual. But this work, this spiritual work, is harder to see, harder to measure. That's why it requires faith. And Jesus then said, from there on through the rest of the chapter, he said, choose to walk in the light. He was saying, follow me. Remember, these people were at the high point. The the Messiah had come into town, and they believed that the time for national rescue was here, but 
But Jesus was more concerned that they pursue his bigger goal of glorifying God by living in the light of his will. Um, and then John interrupts uh, what Jesus was saying in verse 36, because you could read from verse 36 into verse 44. It's all the same message, but John actually interrupts it. He writes in a, another section to call attention to some facts here, uh, because Jesus continued to call for these people to trust in him as the light by believing in him as the one who could save them for all of eternity. But, G, but John interrupted because there's something that the, the readers need to consider. So let's, let's consider them a little bit in this section. Um, end of verse 36, these things Jesus spoke, and he departed and hid himself from them. So he went back to social distancing after he finished saying this stuff. Verse 37, but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. These people had seen Lazarus raised from the dead. They had seen all kinds of other impossible miracles, and they still weren't believing. And John writes here because he wants the reader, he wants you and me to say, am I believing in Jesus? So I have to ask us, are you believing in Jesus? Um, ultimately, the first decision, responding to the gospel, is the, the first part of that. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, because of their sin, but have everlasting life. And then it goes on, verse 18, it says, He who believes in Jesus, in him is not condemned. He who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. So the choice is there for everyone. You have to choose, will I depend on Jesus for eternal life or try to live my life on my own apart from him? Verse 17 said, For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So in asking the question, am I believing in Jesus? Have you trusted in him alone for everlasting life? Acknowledging your sin and asking God for his forgiveness so that you can have eternal life and then live for him all the rest of your days here. That's the first part of the question. But these people were not believing. You'll find that there are a couple that are. But what is my believing looking like? Is my believing reflecting Jesus' priorities? Am I living them out even when they're hard? That's believing in Jesus too. Am I believing in Jesus? John also called attention to the fact that Jesus is God in this passage. Some people say that the Bible doesn't really say Jesus is God, but this is one place where he actually does. I have to show you this. Um, so John said they were not believing in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this cause they could not believe. So that who has believed our report passage is Isaiah 53, 1. So that's what, where Isaiah said that. John says, for this cause they, these people who weren't believing, could not believe. The people in the crowd, everybody. For Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and he hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. These things Isaiah said, and he said them in Isaiah chapter 6. And verses 9 and 10, the blinded eyes, the hardened heart, the not seeing, not he being healed, not being converted. These people who saw all this stuff with Lazarus and everything else were not believing, were proving that. John then said, these things Isaiah said because he, Isaiah, saw his, Jesus, glory. When did he do that? In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah had a vision of God, the king eternal on his throne, robe filling the temple, angels saying things, thunder, lightning, all kinds of stuff. He saw the glory of God, and Isaiah said, that's what these people were seeing, and they were still not believing. Isaiah saw his glory, and he spoke of him. The king on his throne was Jesus. It was the one that these people were seeing, and they were not believing. We, are we seeing, and are we believing? John finished up this section with the fact that some were believing but wouldn't go public with it because they wanted to be viewed okay by the people around them. 
So this interruption is also a warning to us that we cannot value what people think about us more than what God thinks. Here's what it says. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory. Nevertheless, many of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. What do you do when even your Christian friends at school laugh at something they shouldn't? Do you stop that? Do you correct that? Or do you keep quiet because you are concerned about what the rest of the people are going to think about you? What do you do when gossip's happening all around you? Do you participate? Or do you change the conversation's direction? It's easy to participate because everybody in the room is. Have you gone public with your faith simply by being baptized? That, that's a direct command from God for people who trust in Jesus. John is saying, believe in Jesus, and that means following him in public, openly, for the glory of God. I, I want to finish this part of the challenge with faith in Christ that pleases God, goes public for his glory, and for no other reason. And as you think about this passage, as you think about Palm Sunday, and Jesus living for God's glory, and choosing whether you're going to be the kernel or the plant, Choosing whether you're going to follow God it is ultimately your faith in Christ that pleases God and goes public for his glory and for no other reason. Let that be a great product out of this Palm Sunday's consideration. Let me just pray as we close. Father, we thank you for giving us your word and for your son who perfectly lived, perfectly died and rose from the dead and pleased you in everything. Lord, I want to be that kind of person for you too. I pray that each person listening to me today would decide that they want their life to count for Christ and go public with their faith in whatever way is necessary to please you. We're grateful that we can ask you for help with that. We look forward to how you help us change and become more like Jesus all the rest of our days. In Jesus' name, amen. So what do you need to do with this message today? Maybe you need to go public with your faith, either through baptism or some other way, even if it's a, a path that you really don't want to go down. You need to hold to it, even though it's hard. Do you need to stop minimizing the miracles of the Bible and the power of God that only comes by faith, instead of trying to create a narrative that makes it easier for a person uncomfortable with faith? You need to gently and confidently Say, this is what the Bible says, and this is how God says you can have the help and His power. Not, not by throwing it in their face or by being mean about it, but just saying, this is what God says is true. Even though it might disagree with people who are pretty smart and say that it couldn't be true. Do you need to choose different values? Maybe you've been going after the things that you could preserve here and now. Kind of like the dried out kernel just exists alone. And you need to dive into full service for Christ that ignores what you want and what you can have here. Whatever your choice needs to be this Palm Sunday, just know that it matters and it could produce results that are out of this world. Come back and join us again next week as we remember the greatest celebration of all, Easter Sunday. Goodbye for now.